Good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you're calling in from. And welcome to our webinar. Uh, this is the second webinar we're organizing as a build-up to our Unlocking Solar Capital LAC conference, uh, the conference that's taking place next month in Miami, which I will tell, tell you more, more about later. And this webinar is called The Financing of Distributed Generation in LAC. Uh, as you all know, of course, uh, that's why you're here. Solar PV is a hot topic in Latin America. And uh, whilst, of course, the tenders in Mexico and Argentina, as well as the big utility scale projects in Brazil and Chile are drawing a lot of attention, um, there's also other movement going on under the radar in Latin America. And uh, that's distributed generation. Distributed generation is really booming. Um, and there are, so, there are numerous uh, applications for it, uh, varying from commercial and industrial projects, for instance, with hotels and resorts in the Caribbean, to rooftop PV, solar in Mexico, microgrids in Haiti, off-grid solar home systems in Guatemala, and numerous other, other options. All these small installations are starting to add up and uh, therefore drawing also more and more attention of people uh, from all around the world. Um, in a recent study from IRENA, for instance, it, uh, it was mentioned that more than that the Caribbean has more than 500 megawatts of installed solar capacity and much of that is coming from uh, distributed generation. So I think um, the timing of this web webinar is uh, thereby justified. In today's webinar, we'll explore the opportunities that solar bring for Latin America and the Caribbean and discuss the, the key hurdles that need to be overcome to reach uh, solar's full potential. Um, on the agenda, uh, I will have a short introduction to the webinar and then we have presentations from experts. That's why you're here, of course. We have Elio Muller from Solar Axiom. We have Fernando Alvarado from Sustainable Energy Central America and Per van Spy from TCX. Um, and what's important is that uh, the presentations are followed by a Q&A between uh, you, the audience, and uh, the panelists. So um, I will now let you know how you can ask questions. Um, there's a question box in your screen and during all the webinar, you can ask questions to the panelists. You can ask a question um, directed to one of the panelists or uh, just a general questions. We will gather the questions from here at Solar Plaza and we will ask uh, quite some of these questions to the, the panelists. So I would really like to encourage you to ask your questions throughout all the webinar and in the end, uh, you will see them back. If you have any technical issues, uh, please use the, ch the chat box and someone from here will assist you on that. And also what's important for you uh, is that the presentation slides and recordings will be uploaded soon after the webinar. It might take a day or so, but then uh, they will be made uh, available for everyone. So like I said, this webinar is a build up towards the Unlocking Solar Capital Lag Conference, which will be taking place next month in, in Miami uh, on the 28th and 29th of June. Uh, and the conference will gather 200 plus uh, international senior finance and project development ex executives. And what we'll do is discuss um, how to finance solar projects in Latin America, both in the distributed generation segment, as well as the bigger utility scale projects. Um, the focus is really on financing. So a lot of the people that are there are mainly financiers and project developers. And uh, what's an important aspect of the conference is that besides in-depth discussions on stage and uh, presentations, there will be a lot of uh, time for networking and one-on-one uh, -on -one sessions. What's important to mention is that the early bird desk discount will expire tomorrow. So uh, for everyone who is here and uh, not signed up for the, for the conference yet, um, I would like to encourage you to consider this uh, to sign up tomorrow before tomorrow because then you can make use of the early bird discount. Um, this, this conference is organized by us, Solar Plaza, in collaboration with uh, LACCOR, the Latin America and Caribbean Council on Renewable Energy, and FMO, the Dutch Development Bank, and made possible by the sponsors that you now see on the screen. Uh, we as Solar Plaza, we organize conference and trade missions all around the world. And uh, well, by hosting also these kind of webinars, we like to see ourselves as a platform to accelerate the energy, sustainable energy transition. Um, before um, I'm going to the first presentation, I would like to host a sh short poll question to, to see what you think is interesting uh, for this webinar. So um, you can now see it on your screen. And the question is, uh, for what type of distributed generation solar projects do you see most potential in Latin America? 
Uh, is that either commercial industrial solar, is that residential rooftop solar, or is that off-grid solar, which includes microgrids? Uh, I will give you a few more seconds to vote. See that about half of you have voted by now. So we'll leave the poll open a, li a little bit longer. Okay, and we are, we're closing the, the poll now. And as you can see on the screen, uh, commercial and industrial solar uh, is the clear winner over here. Uh, that's also what we expected up front, uh, that, that uh, most people see most potential for that. Uh, let's see what our speakers um, during this, uh, this webinar will uh, see. And therefore, without further ado, I would like to uh, announce the first speaker, um, which is Elio Muller. Um, Elio is the, the CEO of Solar Axiom um, and has m uh, a lot of experience. In, in 1997, Elio formed the Muller Group International, which is an international business consulting firm focused on Latin America, the US and Spain. Under Elio's direction, MGI has led the creation of several power development companies and pro projects throughout Latin America and the U United States. And, and later on, Elio uh, founded Solar Axiom and is now the CEO of that. With Solar Axiom, he develops uh, small solar projects um, in commercial sites in uh, Florida, the Caribbean, and Central America. Um, so, Elio, I would like uh, to give uh, you the floor. Hello to all of the participants. Um, welcome to our, our uh, webinar. Uh, Solar Axiom is a um, developer of commercial industrial uh, distributed generation. Uh, um, we, we are uh, focused uh, on projects that are between 100 kilowatts and one megawatt per site. Our company is self-funded. We, uh, we, we work in three uh, segments of uh, build, own, operate build on transfer and uh, we develop projects for a fee. Uh, we have, have a great deal of our own in-house expertise in engineering, uh, project finance, uh, development and asset management. Uh, I myself was the investment development manager for Central America and the Caribbean at OPIC in, uh, back, back in 2000. Uh, so we, we, um, we engage with commercial customers uh, to bring uh, customized solutions and we can also bring the capital and the finance to to own and operate these projects. Uh, we see this as the segment that is uh, most viable in the Caribbean. Um, I will tailor my presentation today mostly directed toward uh, Caribbean islands, uh, particularly island nations, but uh, Solar Axiom is active here in Florida. In fact, we have several projects uh, completed and, and underway here in Florida, and and we have uh, we have an interest in in Central America and Mexico as well. But uh, for today's purpose, I will focus on on where we are most heavily engaged, which is uh, the Caribbean islands. Um, and where we are really focused on uh, resorts, providing commercial industrial solar solution on large resorts operating in, uh, in, in throughout the Caribbean islands. Pardon me, my, my slides are moving slow. Uh, we are also the grantees um, on uh, on a USAID grant. Give me just a second to get my slides in order here because we got them messed up. We are the um, grantees on a grant for a feasibility study by USAID. 
this is a feasibility study to support the development of solar energy production uh, for a, a portfolio of, of uh, our test case, which uh, is an owner of seven sites of large commercial hotels, as well as commercial buildings, supermarkets, et cetera, and the island of Antigua. Uh, Solar Axiom is the grantee on this for USAID. Uh, we are focusing on resorts operating in small island grids. Uh, the, again, the subject uh, case owns these four large resorts and, uh, and these commercial sites on the island of Antigua. We are working through this study and uh, we are uh, about three quarters of the way through and hopefully we will be finalizing our report at the end of this month or early July. Uh, a great deal of this feasibility study uh, is focusing at challenges, uh, challenges that commercial uh, operators have in being allowed to exploit the solar solutions um, that bring the possibility of self-generation at uh, far less cost to themselves than they're paying the grid. Uh, in the case of Antigua, the grid tariff is approximately 42 cents a kilowatt hour US. Uh, and our cost of generation with solar is, uh, is, is, is one third of that or lower, depending on how we get it financed. Um, we are uh, working through this um, in, in a manner that is engaging with the uh, public utility there to find uh, solutions. Uh, currently in the uh, case of Antigua, they allow uh, interconnection up to 50 kilowatts in a uh, generally transparent application process. And we are seeking uh, to have um, projects up to 500 kilowatts per site. So as, as you can see, we would be proposing something in the area of a accumulation of, of several projects at 500 kilowatts would take our um, projects up to about 3,500 kilowatts, which is quite a lot on a grid that has, uh, has uh, 55 megawatts uh, of, of peak load. Some of the issues um, that we find in developing in the Caribbean is uh, that there are few opportunities for utility scale projects. Um, there is a small universe of large commercial uh, consumers that, that you can work with even in the CNI. Uh, and there are very few uh, large banks active in this region where you could do sophisticated structuring with OPIC or IFC and, and the normal project financing tools are limited because of the limitation of these banks. Um, there, is a, uh, uh, there are varying renewable energy uh, regulation regimes and it, it, for small markets, it takes a great deal of due diligence for the market just for each island almost. Um, there's uh, differing local political factors um, and there are varying uh, and, uh, technical issues that uh, impact these isolated grids. So for very small places with a limited market and limited size per project, you have all of the issues that you would have in a larger market, plus all the ones that impact uh, the small markets. Uh, it makes it very challenging, and therefore there is very little CNI actually happening on uh, most of these islands where it should be uh, growing very quickly. We do not see that growth and we are pioneering breaking through with uh, solutions for, for that growth. One of the things that we've encountered to be the biggest problem is what we have coined the term passive aggressive resistance. Uh, to distributed solar in the Caribbean. And this passive aggressive resistance is, 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 is 
is found in the part of the uh, governments and the utilities in these markets. And, uh, and we call it passive aggressive because and at, the, at the macro level, they're telling the multilaterals and uh, uh, you know, uh, foreign countries and organizations are telling everyone how much they want to uh, have independence from their petroleum uh, based generation and how much they want to grow solar. But when you get to actually trying to uh, do the project, you find a great deal of resistance. Um, there are several reasons that we're already finding and, uh, and, and working through on our, our feasibility study. Uh, these are small isolated grids and they have technical issues uh, that solar can present. If you're bringing, for example, as we're proposing uh, three and a half megawatts in a, in a 55 megawatt grid, uh, and we're working through some of those. I'll address some of those later, but they are, these are real issues and there are real solutions uh, for, these, for these technical issues. Uh, these, uh, these governments and utilities are very concerned about displacement of their revenues. We are uh, working with some of the best paying electric customers on these islands and any part that we displace with solar is seen by these utilities as a loss or potential loss of revenue, and uh, we, we're finding some solutions to, 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 to support the grid and make sure that it is healthy and that we are enhancing it rather than damaging it. Um, these utilities are power monopolies in, 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 in these islands, and they are able to control and restrict commercial customers from their self-generation. Uh, and there's there's, a, there's all kinds of exceptions and things going on, but in, in, in essence, you're dealing with uh, power monopolies that can actually tell a, a, a commercial user to not operate their backup generators uh, and go on the grid. Um, and then you have a variety of commitments to existing generation that is uh, already uh, on these grids, uh, they either have an independent power producer that they've contracted with and they feel very committed to, uh, or the, there's interest uh, on the islands as to who's importing the petroleum, and there's just a, a, a variety of, of, of complications that are folded into the, the, uh, the real concerns with these political uh, concerns, but the political is nevertheless real when it's impacting your ability to develop uh, a project. Um, but these are a lot of the issues that we already had uh, discerned from our customers and why we undertook this feasibility study. Uh, our approach um, is that we, we're, we're, we're very focused at resorts and large commercial buildings. We are not trying to do residential, we're not competing for whatever uh, utility scale solar is existing there. Uh, we bring in, um, uh, we have some preferred vendors that are, are solar installers that we would bring into these markets. Um, but we are we are the developers. We we like the resorts. They're very uh, pre qualified as as credit worthy, uh, and that's good for our own. Uh, risk assessment for investing in their projects, but it's also a great support for the underlying credit uh, for debt facilities. Um, some resort groups also own multiple properties, such as the case study that we have in Antigua, and therefore you're able to aggregate uh, a larger number of projects so that you can have a significant bundle rather than just a small project. We are discovering through our own engineering and through our intense, uh, uh, our intense deep study of the sites uh, uh, engineering, we're finding some solutions. Uh, we find that we can make improvements to the, uh, to the, to the customer so that reflects in uh, alleviating their burden to the grid. One of the things that uh, is common here and we're finding on the islands is that a lot of these resorts are at an extremity of the lines of the distribution lines of the grid. Uh, so therefore, 
uh, they draw a lot of electricity at, at the end of a line um, that is not uh, perfected for for their transformers and, and controls. And therefore, uh, we draw down voltage and, and energy uh, that impacts not just uh, inside the resort, but also the community just outside of the interconnection. Uh, and we find that the more we can improve uh, the stability of the consumption inside the fence, the more we're also improving the grid. Our deep engineering review takes into account all of the consumption on, on, on these sites. Uh, uh, it goes a lot farther than an energy efficiency audit, for example. Um, our, some of our staff has a lot of expertise in engineering, electrical engineering our resorts for many years and, uh, and, and we're able to really understand the, the back of the house operations. These resorts, back of the house operations is, a, is like a small city. Uh, they're, they're desalinating out of water. Uh, they are doing uh, sewage treatment. They are uh, running generators. They're running big refrigeration for their restaurants. Uh, it is uh, quite an operation on each one of these. We're introducing some innovative best practices for these uh, small grids that we're bringing from our knowledge uh, of, of things that a lot of times come late to these small islands. Uh, and uh, for example, uh, we're, we're demonstrating how solar can improve the voltage. The more solar you let us do on, on the peak hours inside the resort, the better we're going to relieve the grid at that site from any voltage drops. Um, we're also uh, engineering in the use of modern and lower expense batteries to stabilize the load so that these small grids aren't seeing a big uh, uh, drop or add of uh, energy due to cloud shade. Um, again, these are issues that are not relevant on a larger grid, but are very relevant when, when you're talking about 3.5 megawatts in a 55 megawatt grid. We, we are also um, uh, addressing the revenue displacement by showing that we can, uh, we can enhance uh, project finance potential by aggregating some volume. Uh, if we were doing just 50 kilowatts as the, if for example, in Antigua, as they, uh, they currently allow, well, we, we can only possibly put together uh, 350, 400 kilowatts. If we are able to, uh, grow that interconnection limit and do three and a half megawatts, then our capital cost, our ability to uh, bring uh, finance, um, you know, will all be enhanced. We'll lower the capital cost because we will aggregate a larger scale and we will bring finance solutions that otherwise would not uh, be available. Uh, credit support structures through OPIC, IFC, ID are all frustrated in the Caribbean because they cannot find large enough projects uh, to, to bring their, their complex uh, solutions to. Um, I think I went beyond my slide there. Um, so therefore, uh, we, we, we're, we're, we're embracing these challenges and we're there to stay. We have uh, we have a vision that this market could be very interesting for for a company like ours. We're we're a small company. We're not uh, we're not trying to do uh, uh, the large scale stuff that other developers are doing. We 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 created Solar Axiom to be able to do these smaller projects, have uh, lower operating expense but at the same time, bring the level of sophistication to these small projects that are normally not found. Um, so with that, I end my, my, my presentation and I'd be glad to address questions when it opens up for that. Thank you very much, Elio. And uh, we indeed, we already see the first questions coming in. So thank you very much for this uh, interesting presentation. Um, I would like to, to move on to the, to the next presentation, uh, which is uh, from Fernando Alvarado. Um, Fernando is a development investment banker with uh, 25 years of international credit and investment experience and 
over 15 years uh, experience with uh, investments in renewable energy, uh, all of that in Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, Fernando uh, has, has uh, been involved in more than 40 investments in renewable energy in Latin America. And um, well, without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Fernando. Um, Fernando, are you there? Yes, uh, hello to everybody. Thank you, Adrian. So I am going to talk about uh, what we do. Uh, I am the CEO of Sustainable Energy Central America, which is an investment advisor for two clean energy uh, funds. Let me go through the slides, if I may. Uh, let's see, it's a little bit slow, but um, let's see. It's, it's okay, there it is. So I am going to talk about what um, the two funds that we manage, which are CABEF and uh, it's uh, almost twin fund HREF uh, do. And essentially we invest in clean energy in the Caribbean basin that includes Central America and the Caribbean countries. Uh, let me move to the following slide. It's uh, acting a little bit slow, but let's see. Okay, basically there we are. So uh, our objective of you know, investing in this sector is especially to promote energy security and obviously uh, environmental sustainability or addressing uh, climate change as well. Um, through these two investment funds, uh, we normally don't uh, act alone when we invest in projects. And, and so we, to a certain extent, try to be cat catalysts uh, for additional investment and co-investment from the entrepreneurs or project developers themselves, uh, as well as from other uh, participants, such as, you know, um, Elio's uh, company, uh, development finance institutions, uh, commercial banks, uh, technology providers, and, and other, you know, participants in, in this um, sector. Uh, let's see, moving to the following slide. Yes, so um, these two funds are impact investors. So uh, we are essentially seeking to generate um, positive environmental and uh, social impacts. Uh, in terms of environmental impact, we, you know, the main uh, met metrics, it's, uh, you know, re reduction or, or carbon offsets. And uh, in terms of um, social and economic impact, we are targeting uh, investing through the two funds in a portfolio of, I would say, between 30 and uh, 40 renewable energy and energy efficiency projects in, in both Central America and the Caribbean combined, uh, which would in turn generate um, in aggregate between 250 and 300 megawatts of clean energy generation. And obviously, you know, with, with that generation, the carbon offsets that come associated with it. We're talking about potentially up to 600,000 tons of carbon um, uh, CO2 equivalent. Uh, and in terms of household, households uh, receiving clean energy, you know, from, from our supported projects, we're talking in excess of 400,000 uh, households. Why we do this or, or why, you know, it makes sense, I, I think it's obvious and, and Elio mentioned it, cost of electricity, especially in the Caribbean, is, is very high. In Central America, is perhaps a half or a third of what it is, but still makes a lot of sense to displace costly, uh, mostly thermal-based generation uh, with uh, renewable energy. So that's, you know, essentially why, why, you know, we do this. In addition to that, uh, now seems to be a right moment to be, you know, active in, in the region because uh, from a uh, regional point of view, all the countries, especially in the Caribbean, are, you know, supporting clean energy uh, and have uh, either, you know, enabling legal frameworks or incentives that uh, make it appealing for us to participate. Uh, in addition to that, we want to, call, you know, bridge certain financing gaps that we see in these countries, especially lack of, you know, capital markets uh, 
rights and, and, and equity to invest uh, in these projects. And at the same time, uh, a lead investor of ours is the multilateral investment fund of the Inter-American Development Bank. And so uh, these two funds, CABF and HREF, are in alignment with their strategies and, and, and objectives uh, for, for the region. In terms of funding and instruments, uh, so the two funds together uh, target a total capitalization of $100 million. We currently have $63 million, and with that, we are already you know, building our portfolio of investments in Central America and the Caribbean, but we are also in, in the process of attracting additional uh, investors to, uh, to the family. And uh, with respect to instruments, we are not a, you know, a lender, a, what, what a traditional commercial lender or even development bank would do. We do not offer uh, senior debt, but rather we come with certain instruments that uh, by design would be assuming higher uh, risks in the projects. So we're talking about essentially uh, investing in subordinated debt, being subordinated related to the uh, senior lenders, especially in larger projects. We can invest um, with, with shares of the projects, either preferred or common shares, depending on what um, you know, is possible and what uh, the sponsors in the projects are willing to offer. Uh, and then we can tailor financing for uh, you know, either energy efficiency projects or combinations of solar PV distributed generation with energy efficiency or co-generation as well. And we can do that by offering financial or operating leasing and some other um, structures such as energy as a service that uh, you know, I can refer later on during the Q&A session. Uh, and at the same time, we are also uh, looking at offering revolving facilities for energy services companies and project developers that um, that can also in turn, you know, uh, allocate those funds in smaller projects. Um, so a little bit more specific on, on what we do. In terms of um, size of investments, we're talking about here starting as, as low as a million dollars per project. And um, the maximum that we can offer right now per project is $6.3 million, which is essentially 10% of the current capitalization. When we you know, um, add more, more funds, more investors, then obviously that, that limit, that maximum per project would go up. Um, and actually there are some developers that, that come with more than one project. In those cases, we can invest up to 15% of the fund per economic group. In terms of investment focus, we are looking at, uh, as I mentioned, renewable energy generation, both grid connected and off grid. And in terms of off grid, our preference is commercial and industrial, uh, but, obviously, but we are not necessarily just limited to that. Only that given our minimum of a million dollars per project makes more sense to focus in, a, in this sector, CNI, that can generate larger uh, transactions. Uh, we're also looking at energy efficiency uh, and other energy savings applications, such as combined cooling, heating, and power, especially for the hotel industry. Uh, and we're also interested in developing partnerships with strategic investors and players, such as you know, developers like uh, Solar Axiom and others, uh, financiers, uh, and uh, other uh, you know, key stakeholders like impact investors, et cetera. Um, and then in terms of um, the instruments, I already talked a little bit about this, but essentially, oops, let me go back. We're talking about um, equity and mezzanine finance. Uh, mezzanine finance, for those who are not so familiar, normally understood as you know, something that is uh, assuming higher risks than, than secure debt, but lower risks than pure equity. Uh, I already talked about the uh, possibility of offering tailored financial and operating leasing. Um, and uh, as I already mentioned, uh, we do not offer uh, senior debt. So rather than competing with the commercial and development banks, we, we want to actually work together with them. In terms of eligible technologies, in addition to solar, you know, all that are 
have, you know, possible depending on the resources available in each country, we, we can invest. That includes, you know, biomass, hydropower, biogas, LP, LPG, LNG, especially for cogeneration, solar PV, solar thermal, wind energy, and obviously energy efficiency, very important, especially in the Caribbean with the cost of electricity. So now I wanted to actually focus on how we are approaching the, you know, the reality in the Caribbean of smaller projects, because even though there are some opportunities for larger utility uh, scale projects, these are, these are not uh, so abundant. And the majority of the projects that we see obviously are in the space of, uh, you know, energy efficiency or, or, or uh, solar PV, but, but are not so large. So we have, uh, you know, two main approaches. One is working in collaboration with developers, such as Solar Ax Axiom or um, energy efficiency companies, or let's call them ESCOs, energy saving service uh, companies, uh, which would work as an aggregator of projects. So they would have their own pipeline of, of projects. And uh, so in, it's their intention to obviously, you know, be able to, to sell solutions, turnkey solutions to the clients. And so what we would do is we would look at that pipeline and come and uh, make direct investments in those uh, end clients, either through these agreements or energy as a service, et cetera. It, it helps a lot if that uh, ESCO that would be an, an aggregator of projects can bring a pipeline that, that has you know, similar technologies, um, same technical and implementation risks, and uh, such that we can offer similar terms for the clients and in that way have a more streamlined approval process. So we invest, we, we approve, let's say, one facility for a certain amount and, um, and, and from there we can, you know, do the deployment uh, much, much quicker. Then the other alternative is to treat the ESCO directly as a client and that is, you know, um, possible if we feel comfortable, obviously, about the business case of the ESCO and that's financial standing, management, et cetera. And so what we do is in true ESCO fashion, we make an investment or provide a, a you know, credit facility to the ESCO itself and let the ESCO then you know, use those funds to develop um, its, its own pipeline and manage um, its clients. That's, that's another possibility that, that we are also uh, implementing right now. Um, I just also wanted to give some examples of projects that we have in the pipeline that I thought it could be interesting for some of you. Um, let's see, okay, there it is. Okay, so for example, uh, we uh, have approved an investment um, in, a, in the Dominican Republic uh, for around three and a half million dollars that is going to finance with equity the initial deployment of around 12 uh, solar PV uh, installations roofed up in commercial and industrial clients. Uh, we have a business and technical uh, partner and, um, and, and the way we work is we would take the lead and deploy our own funds equity to make sure that we, uh, you know, make go and, and, and install the first few projects. And once they are already operating, we would take them to a bank and try to leverage debt on, on those performing assets. What we are doing is de-risking the project and, uh, and assuming construction risk. Ideally, we would want the banks to assume construction is and risk with us, but in a way to actually, you know, expedite the, the deployment of the funds and, and the construction of the portfolio, we would do this and we would stay for a long term managing, you know, the, the portfolio of, of, of the 12 projects for 10 to 12 years. That's just one example of how we do um, CNI. Uh, let's see another example. Fernando, uh, yeah. just a short um, interruption. Uh, we're getting a bit over time, so if you could uh, maybe speed it up a little bit, it would be good. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. The the other example is I already talked about this. You know, with uh, an energy service company, we are based basically providing a revolving debt facility for them to implement 
renewable energy projects. And then another uh, sector of interest is uh, investing similarly in combined cooling, heating, and power projects that could eventually also incorporate solar or not. Uh, and so we offer turnkey solutions to you know, the, the clients that in some cases actually are you know, uh, resort owners. And lastly, uh, we do face obviously certain challenges when, when operating in the region. Uh, obviously, so many project, you know, countries involve diverse legal frameworks and, and also changing conditions. Um, there's still lots of education to be done because sometimes the clients don't really understand, you know, the costs and benefits of, of the projects, uh, the lack of capital, as I already mentioned, in these uh, markets. And um, there, even though there, there is debt at times from commercial banks, the conditions are not ideally tailored to the reality of the projects. And also the currency risk and, and my, you know, uh, the following speaker will, would address this is also uh, present in some uh, transactions. At the same time, there are so many players getting into the market that, uh, you know, it's, it, it also involves certain, you know, uh, work to really screen the good uh, from the bad ones. Uh, we, in general, try to address these by, you know, improving our or, or, or doing deeper legal due diligence, um, trying to be as effect, efficient as possible to shorten the, you know, legal, I mean, the investment uh, process. Um, and as I already mentioned in the example that I covered, we are trying to assume on our own construction risk to then make it easier to other participants to come and join us. Uh, we are even assuming, uh, you know, uh, foreign exchange uh, risk um, and just staying, you know, a current on what is happening by participating in, in events like, uh, you know, these solar plaza events and some other regional conferences. So I'll leave it there. And, uh, and then obviously in the Q and A session, we can talk again, so thank you. Thank you very much, Fernando, for this uh, interesting presentation. Sorry to cut you short, uh, but uh, it seems that a lot of people are very engaged in your presentation given the number of questions. Uh, so that's good. We uh, will see a few of them in the Q&A later on. Um, I would like to proceed to the last presentation, uh, the one of Per. Per van Zwaai uh, works with TCX since 2010, and he's responsible for the business development of TCX. Uh, prior to TCX, Power worked in the African project finance at FMO, the Dutch Development Bank, and before moving into banking and development finance, he has also worked as a corporate lawyer. Um, per, are you there? Yes, um, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, one sec. Uh, yeah, thanks everybody. Um, I've put up uh, some other names here. Uh, I'll explain very briefly in a second what TCX does, how we operate, and then have some few general messages around the local currency products, because that's what TCX is all about. Um, we are a derivative business and we support lending in local currency by international lenders. Uh, the names that I put up here, but besides myself, are Andre Sorochan, who is uh, from the trading team, covers the Latin American region. Uh, Maria Alejandra supports us uh, out of Bogota, uh, which is great for the uh, same time zone support. And uh, Jorge Santisteban uh, operates out of Miami for MFX solutions. And I'll explain in a second how MFX and TCX are uh, very closely related to one another. Um, TCX is the uh, exchange rate uh, treasury vehicle for a very large group of investors. All the major or many of the major DFIs are our shareholders. Um, they came together 10 years ago realizing that local currency lending in many markets was not possible for them because the banks, this, these lenders themselves, cannot take exchange rate risk. Hence, were dependent on, being, on the availability of hedge providers 
and in many of their markets where they operate, hedge markets were either not existent or otherwise very shallow. Uh, and that then led to the creation of TCX. So TCX is a hedge provider and operates in markets where the commercial banks are either not at all active or uh, active only in very short tenors uh, or only accessible to very few partners. So you see us as an extension of commercial banks in the offering of currency hedging products. Um, we have a single product. And I immediately want to describe that because I think that's essential. Um, what we support is local currency lending by international lenders. So we're talking about uh, off-grids, mini-grids, CNI businesses. So imagine that that is the onshore borrower and imagine an international lender, whether it's the IFC or the FMO or uh, any other party. It doesn't have to be a TCX shareholder. It could be any uh, lender. Um, there's no need to be a shareholder of TCX to use us. Um, if the borrower and the lender collect uh, together conclude that uh, the loan should be a local currency liability for the borrower, um, the lender can come to TCX, especially if it's an illiquid market, knowing that commercial banks are not offering hedges. It can come to us and we can together agree to offer a hedge enabling the lender to lend in local currency. And how does it work? I think an example is useful to quickly run through it um, uh, uh, as it is quite essential. Um, imagine that the lender wants to offer a $1 million equivalent loan to the borrower. Let's say it's a three year period. And imagine also that the, at the moment that the loan is disbursed, the exchange rate of the local currency, the LCY refers to any local currency. So an imaginary local currency, imagine that at disbursement, the exchange rate is 10 to the dollar. That means that when the loan is disbursed, the hedge is executed at that same time. And what it does is it, for, it fixes the borrower's replay, repayment obligation in local currency terms. The exchange rate was 10 to the dollar, hence the local currency repayment of the obligation of the borrower is fixed at 10 million local currency. So 10 million pesos or quetzales or whatever it is. And whatever happens to the dollar local currency exchange rate, the borrower is not affected by it. If at repayment date, let's say three years later, the exchange rate have moved from 10 to 20, uh, the borrower must still repay his 10 million local currency units and at the then applicable exchange rate of 20, that is $500,000. Um, that is also the amount of dollars that the borrower sends back to the lender. So to, to note here what happens while this is a local currency loan, the typical structure, the one that we support, um, is that it's a local currency loan, but the borrower will receive dollars at disbursement from the lender and must service the local currency loan with dollars. So it's a local currency liability, but cash flows are still in dollars. Um, that can be a benefit. The borrower typically needs the, the, the loan proceeds to make acquisitions offshore. So it immediately has the dollars available, doesn't have to do spot transactions. It can use those dollars, probably will keep it offshore at disbursement and use it to purchase equipment, let's say in China. Of course, the downside is that uh, having to source dollars to service the loan when repayments must be made. Uh, in many Latin American countries, that is not an, at all an issue. Uh, at most, it's an inconvenience. But of course, there are also countries, uh, Nigeria is an example, Azerbaijan, where following the oil crisis uh, and, uh, and uh, the, the, the resulting scarcity of dollars in the economy, this was a problem. I think I think in Central America and Latin America, uh, much less so. But this is how the product works. Um, when the loan is repaid, the borrower only sends back half a million, so the lender misses half a million. However, uh, at the same time, there is a swap between the lender and TCX that matures. And the way to see the swap is precisely uh, as, it, as it is named, an exchange of two loans. So it is as if when it was executed, the lender instead of lending 1 million to the borrower, lend 1 million to us. TCX lent in return 10 million in local currency to the lender, and that 10 million local currency loan was passed on by the lender to the borrower. And at maturity, 
those two imaginary loans between TCX and the lender are also settled, uh, repaid. So, so we repay $1 million uh, to the lender. That was the loan that we received from him. And it must repay to us the 10 million local currency loan that we provided. However, at the then prevailing uh, exchange rate, uh, it's only 500,000. And we only settle the net, which is, of course, uh, 500,000. In other words, we must pay 500,000 to the lender, which is precisely the amount that was missing. Uh, that's, uh, I think, the simplest way to see the swap, the derivative. Uh, it's really not that complicated in concept. Um, and of course, a critical element of the whole structure is that we will uh, uh, provide the local currency interest rate. So if the lender comes to us and says, on a dollar loan, I won't want to earn 5%, and let's say, well, and in this specific local currency, the hedge cost is 8%, for example, then we will tell the lender, you can now charge, you can offer a local currency loan at an aggregate all-in cost of 8 our hedge rates plus their 5% credit margin, so 13%, for example. Whether that hedge rate is high or low, of course, all depends on the views that you have on the currency. Okay, I just want to introduce MFX because if you start looking at hedging and local currency lending, you will come across MFX solutions. MFX is a close partner of T TCX, and what they do is act as an intermediary between us and sometimes in more liquid markets between other banks, like uh, so it could be any commercial bank, and uh, uh, impact lenders, DFIs. Um, the, the reason that they, they exist and, they, and, the, and the role they play is to eliminate the need for collateral. Normally, if we or a bank transacts with a lender, uh, provides a hedge, there's a, a standard contract which implies and requires collateral posting by the lender to us or the bank. MFX, when MFX acts as an intermediate, that need is not there. No collateral needs to be posted. Instead, MFX relies on an OPIC guarantee uh, which absorbs the credit risk. So especially for smaller funds where liquidity is an issue, MFX provides a very important service by acting as an intermediate, intermediate and eliminating the need for collateral. So that's the, 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 the division of roles between the two of us, um, not competitors, but very complementary uh, partners. We operate globally because we combine the local currency lending effort of 20, 25, 30 uh, lenders and through MFX and other 50, 60 lenders, we have a very naturally globally diversified portfolio. Um, we're active in 60, 70 countries. Our revenue model is, as you saw from the example I just, I just painted, what we earn continuously on every deal we do is the interest rate difference between the dollar interest rates and the local currency interest rates. We charge to the lender the higher local currency interest rates and we, and we receive the lower dollar interest rate. That difference is our, that is our income. Uh, on the other hand, we are constantly compensating our counterparties for depreciation losses. On average, uh, over many billions of dollars now transacted over the last 10 years in 60 different currencies, that leads to a very marginal plus to TCX. So the whole notion of uh, local currency lending being expensive, there are many, it all depends on what perspective you have, but when comparing to dollar borrowing, so asking the question, are dollar, is a dollar loan cheaper than a local currency loan? On a, on a large, when you, when you ask that question relative to a large pool of transactions, the answer is absolutely not. Dollar borrowing plus the cost of depreciation roughly equals uh, local currency borrowing at a higher nominal interest rate. That's a crucial bit of empirical evidence, which um, is important to share with you. We operate as a shock, as a volatility absorption vehicle for uh, basically for businesses in emerging markets. 
Uh, and that is reflected in our P&L. So sometimes when uh, there is a global currency crisis in many countries, we will go through losses. When uh, markets are stable, we might uh, generate profit. On average, we are marginally profitable. Good. I was just uh, assuming, just, just gonna, because I, we're, I know we're a little bit uh, uh, stuck on time, so very, very quickly going to uh, share a few key messages, assuming I would like to go to back one slide, I'm not sure how to do it. Ah, here we go. Um, so let's just imagine a CNI business or an off-grid company, it doesn't really matter, uh, that is has a long-term contract with uh, uh, with either with households or, or, or businesses or a CNI customer. So it's generating, in principle, local currency revenues. And that has to, uh, so it's generating local currency revenues. However, it has to make uh, equipment purchases offshore, typically China, for solar panels and the like. Uh, and this is now, uh, for the first time, looking at debt finance. Uh, it's been, it's been uh, fueled thus far with grants and equity, and now it's time to expand and raise debt. Um, uh, and the question then, of course, is what, what will it take? Will it take borrowing in dollars or in local currency? And many CFOs and many businesses are, are at a stage in this young industry, which is now growing rapidly uh, with that choice, dollar borrowing at a lower nominal interest rate, but with the risk, with exchange rate risk or uh, uh, local currency loans with a higher nominal interest rate. What do we do? There's a couple of messages very quickly again. Uh, message one, uh, we often hear uh, people say, yeah, but I need dollars to buy equipment, so I should be borrowing in dollars. That is a quite a basic, but also very fundamental thinking error. The, the currency of your debt funding in principle is always determined by the currency of your revenue. So if you're earning quetzales, your long-term liability should be in quetzales. If you need dollars to make equipment purchases, you can buy dollars. Um, and very often, as I said, if you, if you remember the, the uh, example I gave, very often, uh, even local currency loans are disbursed in dollars. That's message number one. Message number two is that whether you, when you're thinking about dollar funding versus local currency funding, you should not be thinking, first of all, about the relative cost, because over time they will even out. But you should be thinking about what you are comparing in terms of uh, uh, st stability in your cash flows. If you borrow in dollars while you're a local currency generator, they, these may be three of your imaginary future debt service cash profiles. You have no idea of knowing what your debt service cash profile will look like in local currency terms. Whilst if you borrow in local currency, it will be like this, or maybe at this or that, right? The actual level of the green line depends on the hedge cost, but it will be stable, predictable, uh, and you are uh, insulated from any credit risk. Message number three, the notion that local currency is more expensive than dollar funding is, as a general statement, incorrect, uh, uh, which is also evidenced by the TCX model. Uh, we are, again, marginally profitable, which proves that point. And another way of looking at it, local currency rates, um, Local, if you borrow in local currency, yes, you're paying a higher nominal interest rate. Obviously, if you're borrowing in dollars, you will have a lower nominal interest rate, but you must immediately add to that lower dollar interest rate uh, the projected annual cost of depreciation of the currency that you are uh, operating in. So in, in expectation, there should be uh, equal if certain economic parameters hold, which of course in practice is not always true, uh, however, if you choose the hedged option or the local currency option, you are fully insured, not exposed to any stability, and you have full predictability of all your debt service uh, costs uh, for, the, for the future. Finally, I want to say that local currency can be sourced not only from domestic banks, which intuitively is where you would expect local currency to be sourced, and uh, ideally that is also what you do, However, local currency can also be sourced from international lenders because they have access to hedging institutions like TCX. So those were my four uh, messages. 
uh, there's numerous considerations that will actually go into a decision for one option or the other. I will not talk about that uh, and leave it at that for now. Thank you. Thank you, Per. Uh, and uh, well, as you already noted, we're a bit over time, so we will have to, Q to keep the Q&A very short. Um, I will ask uh, all of you uh, one of the questions that, that came in, um, and I have to ask you to, to answer briefly. Um, the first question that I want to ask is to Fernando. Uh, Fernando, uh, there was someone uh, who was interested to hear what kind of IRR uh, you can expect with uh, the projects that you're investing in and what uh, the minimum IRR is that your funds uh, need. Okay, thank you, Adrian. Uh, at the very least, I would say 13% uh, IRR, uh, thinking that we are, um, you know, a passive investor that can stay for as long as 12, 13 years. Um, and, but it's on a very case by case basis. I mean, depending on the project, uh, in average at portfolio level, we are targeting somewhat slightly higher returns because again, we are deploying equity. We, you know, it's, it should be benchmarked against the leveraged IRRs of those projects and not necessarily, not necessarily against uh, lending rates. Uh, but yes, I would say at the very least, uh, IRRs would be in the range of 13% more or less. Thank you. And Elio, there was a question for you. Uh, what the expected aggregate project size is in terms of total cost and uh, amount of debt and or equity financing that you seek from third parties uh, in your average projects? We are... Uh... We're, we're looking at different markets, different sizes, but uh, we, a lot of times we will uh, invest in trying to enter a market and then expand it. So uh, our, we, we would like to keep the uh, market uh, focused in, in the one to three and a half million dollar potential per, per island country. Uh, but, you know, sometimes we're starting with uh, with a 200 kilowatt uh, 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 pilot project that may have a $650,000 investment and, uh, and, and with the expectation of growing uh, that market from there. So we, 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 we have an entry level threshold and then we have a market threshold. Okay. Good. Uh, and Per, there was a question for you. First of all, if you're also active in Mexico, and secondly, uh, how, how you secure uh, that senior loans uh, after construction for banks? How, how do you secure the senior loans after construction for banks? Is it a form of por portfolio approach or do you use asset collateralization? Um, well, the first part of the question is we we are uh yeah no we're not really active in mexico because that's a very uh a relatively liquid hedge market still um mfx for example does uh, uh, uh does cover mexico so the, the in general we have this concept of additionality uh so we don't step in in markets that are well served by the banks it is generally true for Mexico, however, if certain parties don't get access to the banks or the deals that they uh, can, can achieve are clearly non-market, then we or MFX can potentially uh, step in. I'm not sure I fully understood the second question. Um, we, we don't lend ourselves, so we don't do anything. Against, uh, we don't secure ourselves or need to secure ourselves. We're not a, a, a lender. So I, 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 Sounds to me that it was yeah. it, 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 as a uh, yeah. I think indeed I, I didn't have uh, much time to to look at the question, but I think indeed uh, the question was asked uh, whether you would be a lender. Uh, yeah. Let me see. There, were, uh, there was uh, there were more questions coming in for you. Um, yeah, there was uh, someone uh, was interested if there's a certain kind of skill that's needed uh, in order for TCX to to become involved in a deal. A skill. Yeah, uh, how, how big the the investment must be before uh, TCS can come uh, come into play? Oh, pardon me, a skill? No, uh, a minimum size or anything? No, we in principle don't have that. 
Um, but what we do have is that okay, we we have a uh, the TCX in principle works with the lenders, so we will work with development finance lenders, with other impact lenders, uh, international banks in principle also, uh, intermediary debt funds, uh, the, the, the Fernando's funds in principle we would be able to work with. We don't work in principle with the end client or a corporate directly. Um, so the, the, the question could be, is there a minimum loan size that TCX would support? And the question to that would be, uh, no, there's no minimum really. Um, MFX on occasion may work directly with uh, a corporate uh, and they don't, they also don't really maintain a minimum uh, size. So I, I think neither of us would uh, want to see a transaction not happening simply because it's small. Okay. Good. Well, there are, there are more questions uh, I could ask you. Uh, however, we're already over time and I see the first people are dropping out because they have probably other appointments coming up. So I would like to, to round off the webinar here. I would like to thank uh, Fernando, Elio and Per all for their presentations. As I said before, uh, the presentations and the webinar recordings will be made available, available uh, afterwards. Uh, I think they will come online tomorrow. Uh, also, what I said before, the, uh, for people that are not yet registered for the conference in Miami, the early bird discount will expire tomorrow. So if you're still considering it, uh, I would like to encourage you to uh, make the decision before tomorrow so you can enjoy, enjoy the early bird tariff. Thank, thank you all for listening and uh, have a nice day.